This week we're in the Netherlands capital, Amsterdam. Battling the city's monster crowds. The streets are really small, the canals are really narrow, and those areas just get completely overcrowded. You have lentils, yep. you have chickpeas, you have these fried onions. Chomping our way around Cairo. All in this one dish. Yes. Yeah. And listen up. The best tech for your ears to take on holiday. What you say in Mandarin, we'll play in my ear in English. Yeah, let's, let's see if it works. Yeah. I'm excited. It's long been known as Venice of the North, with its colourful 17th century houses, network of canals and bridges, and picturesque old city centre. It's not surprising that Amsterdam has become a favourite with tourists. It is an explosion of tourists. We have acquired times in the past, but now we don't have quiet times anymore. Tourists are the whole year around. One study claims that numbers have shot up from 11 million in 2005 to around 18 million annual visitors. That's a lot of people in a city of just 850,000 residents. So how do locals feel about this constant influx of tourists? We have seen that it's really, really risen in popularity in the last years and the streets are really small, the canals are really narrow. When there's so many tourists, they tend to centre around the same areas and those areas just get completely overcrowded. People who come here for the first time always want to go to the Anne Frank House. They stay around the red light district sometimes. They maybe don't realise that we have so many other nice areas and so many other things to offer. Cities across Europe have seen similar rises, sparking a wave of anti-tourist protests. In reaction, the Amsterdam authorities have introduced new laws restricting the number of tourist shops in the city centre and enforcing tougher rules on hotels and Airbnb lets. Measures have also been taken at individual sites, like the ever-popular Van Gogh Museum. This used to be one of the city's great hotspots for tourists. People would queue here for up to three hours to buy tickets. But as of recently, tickets are only available for pre-purchase online, meaning far less crowding on the day and a much more pleasant experience for visitors. The tourist board have also been looking for new modern ways to keep both tourists and locals happy. We think, first of all, the city is a city of the inhabitants. They own the city. Um, and visitors are welcome, but it, it should be not be an open-air uh, uh, attraction park. Within the last year, Franz and his team trialled a pilot called Rheinrader. It monitors the size of crowds at popular sites. When crowds get too big, it warns the user, suggesting less busy attractions. What we try to do is to open up. It ties into another campaign to encourage tourists to visit areas outside the old town into the wider metropolitan area. We can influence them to go not again to the city centre but go to the neighbourhoods. You still have to uh, address the challenge in the city centre and this can help. New regulations and visitor initiatives can only go so far. So the Amsterdam Institute for Metropolitan Solutions have proposed a rather more radical solution. One that seems torn from the pages of a science fiction novel. Robot boats. Self-driving vessels moving passengers and goods around Amsterdam's canals. You have these canals, which is 25% of the surface of Amsterdam is, is water. It's not roads, it's water. So why don't you use that infrastructure that's already there again for uh, moving people and goods in and out of the city. At the same time we saw a lot of developments in autonomous driving on the road and they came up with the idea of autonomous boats, we call them rowboats, that could be deployed in the city. So far only miniature versions of the rowboats have been tested on the canals. But Stefan is certain their full-size counterparts will enhance the visitor's experience. 
One idea sees passengers hail the boats with an Uber-style app. In the city, you can get everywhere by boat. So for tourists, it's, it's a nice way. It's not the fastest way, but you can look around and at the same time go to your favorite museum or restaurant or hotel. Stefan says the rowboats could be up and running within the next three to four years, providing tourists with fewer crowds and a new futuristic draw to this historic city. And if you're thinking of taking a trip here, here are our travel show tips on what to know before you go. The Rijksmuseum is home to Rembrandt's Night Watch and other works from the Dutch Old Masters. You might have to fight to see them though. It's one of the Netherlands' most popular museums, attracting over two million visitors last year. The busiest days are Friday through Sunday. So get there for opening at 9 a.m early in the week to beat the crowds. If you don't want to see great works of art, how about the tiny wonders of Micropia? It's the world's first museum dedicated to microbes, the single cell organisms that live all around us, including a body scanner that'll give you an intimate look at the microbes living inside of you. Look at all those! Yeah, they're I'm everywhere. Them. Let's have a look in the large intestine then. Oh, there's a lot. Nearly 99% of all bacteria on the body live in your intestines. And every August, there's the Grachten Festival, which has been running for more than 20 years. It's a 10-day event which stages classical music concerts around the canals. You'll have your pick of 250 performances in 90 venues, with a highlight being the free Prinzenkrucht concert, staged on a pontoon. Next this week, our travels take us to North Africa, to one city more famous for its hats than anything else. But Fez in Morocco has another claim to fame, one which makes places like Oxford and Cambridge seem like relative newbies. She dedicated all her wealth for building this uh, uh, institution. And uh, during the time of building, she was devoted and she fasted a long time uh, at the time of ending the building. university over the world because it is recorded in the Guinness World Records that is continuing now from the past to be operating and to be uh, really working as a university that is giving the chance for anyone who wants to study to have its curricula in this university. خزانة القرويين من أهم الخزانات في العالم العربي والإسلامي لماذا؟ لأنها بالنظر إلى الرصيد إذن هذه نسخة من مصحف كريم تعود إلى القرن التاسع الميلادي مكتوب على جلد الغزال في خط كوفي قديم وأسماء الصور كتبت بماء هذا الكتاب مكتبة القرويين هي مفتوحة في وجه الجميع وخصوصا في وجه الطلبة والأساتذة الباحثين وخصوصا خصوصا الباحثين الذين يشتغلون على تحقيق التراث الإسلامي وفي المستقبل إن شاء الله هناك مجموعة من المشاريع التي سنحرص أنها تصب جميعها في خدمة العلم والباحثين عن العلم يعني هذا هذا كل شيء to come on the travel show.
Ni hao. The best tech to make yourself understood wherever you are. Hello. How are you today? What is your name? Yes, we have translation. And busting the myths about Egyptian food. So gooey that I have to put on some gloves to eat it. Addy takes his tummy on a tour of Cairo. As we say in the UK, the proof is in the pudding. Mm. You might have noticed more and more people walking around seemingly talking to themselves. That's because there's been a lot of development in these things, hearables. The idea is that earbuds aren't just headphones, but are actually in-ear computers that go beyond basic music listening and can help with everything from directions to translating foreign languages to even keeping you fit while on your travels. The Google Pixel Buds operate via touch and voice control. Once connected to your phone via Bluetooth, you can listen to music, have your notifications read to you, and even translate on the fly. And like a lot of this kind of tech, the Pixel Buds are reliant on the software behind it, which in this instance is Google Assistant, which you trigger by saying, OK, Google, or by pressing the right earbud. How do I get to Oxford Street? Head southwest, then turn right. The sound quality is loud and clear, but because they sit on the outside of your ear canal, they do let in a lot of outside noise. And as is the case with any hearable, you will need to get over the fact that it will look like you're talking to yourself. Next up, the Braggy Dash Pros. The buds are completely wireless and can be activated through touch, voice control and even gestures. I can tap my cheek to access different functionalities and nod or shake my head to control music and take calls. Pretty handy if you're feeling a little bit nervous about pulling your phone out in a crowded place. And if you link the buds to an iPhone, you can translate up to 40 languages by connecting to the iTranslate app. And Yuki here is going to help me see how well they work. And in theory, that should play in my ears. What you say in Mandarin will play in my ear in English. Yeah, let's, let's see if it works. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> 你好,你今天好吗?你叫什么名字? Hello, how are you today? What is your name? Yes, we have translation. Oh, I'm going to try and speak back to you now. So, quick tap of the left bud to trigger that. Hello, I'm having a wonderful day, loving the sunshine, and my name is Lucy. Ooh, it does come out in Mandarin to me. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. I understood Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> now, I thought that was quite seamless. The fact that we weren't handing the phone back and forth to each other, I thought was quite nice. I've got your translation in my ear. It was ex it was on point, wasn't it? It was accurate. Um, the app's a bit expensive, $4.99 a month. So that's kind of its downside. But I think this is a wonderful insight into the future of cross-language communication. I'm impressed. To find out just what we can expect from this sort of tech in the future, I'm meeting with Mike, who's an expert in wearables. So what have you got? What can we play with? OK, so we've got these. These are from a company called New Hearer. Mm -hmm. And essentially, they will stream your music, like, you know, like AirPods, like other hearables, but it has a special feature, which is augmented hearing or augmented audio. So the idea is that you kind of, you know, you can be more picky about the, the audio or sounds that you hear in your environment. So there's different profiles that you can have. So whether you're in a restaurant, whether you're out on a busy street, yeah. or, you know, even on a plane, you can kind of can take more control Drown of what you hear. Out. Can I have a listen? Yeah, sure. It's quite, quite noisy in here. So they're in, they're nice and comfortable. And then from here, you can kind of control if you want more world noise. Or you can dial it back. And then hopefully oh, wow. you should be There's able to really hear. There's a big difference in yeah. that, yeah. And well, they, when you speak, it's, it's really loud now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what else have you got for me to look at? So something a little bit different. Yeah, um, they certainly look different this to the last is, one. So this is from a company called Lifebeam. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called Lifebeam V. So essentially they're sports headphones. But the key difference here, with, you know, a lot of different sports headphones, is they have an AI coach and essentially she will coach you to kind of, you know, stay on top of your fitness, you know, whatever level you're at. So yeah. it's great if, you know, you're having gym withdrawal symptoms on holiday yeah. and it's like, I need someone to keep Must me. Must work out. So can I give them a go? Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm going to give them a try in the real world. Cool. See how Good they luck. fare. Thank you. Have fun. So she's telling me to add some music. And quite an excitable tone. Obviously music is a great accompaniment 
um, when you're running hell for leather. I'll start the clock when you start moving. Sound quality's good. Start out with the light job. So it's a little bit weird having someone this excitable in your ear, but that's what she's here for, to offer motivation. Let's start this run. She's telling me to move, so that's what I'm going to do. And finally this week, we head to Egypt, a country to which travellers are just starting to return after several bad years. We sent Addy to the capital, Cairo, to find out how foodies there are trying to stir interest in dishes that until now have not been widely celebrated. Egypt, a country blessed with a wealth of attractions. If you come here as a tourist, there's no shortage of things to see and do. Most people come on holiday to Egypt for the ancient history. The last time I came, it was for the beautiful beaches and the lovely weather. You wouldn't normally put food at the top of your list of reasons to be here, but there's a new group of people who are working really hard to make us all fall in love with Egyptian cuisine. I'm in the capital, Cairo, where street food is visible everywhere you turn. Typical local cuisine is dominated by beans, grains and lots of rich flavours. Now up until recently, it hasn't received as much international recognition as other Middle Eastern styles. And we were like, OK, we're going to do a food vlog. But local entrepreneur Mia Neza is hoping to change that. She and her foodie friend Lila Hazabella founded what they claim to be the first tour of its kind in the capital. It all started off with Leila, my business partner. Um, she was in Italy, she was hungry. Um, she found this uh, pasta restaurant on the internet. She went there, she had the worst lasagna of her life. <laughs> Wasted tummy space, who wants that? Yeah. Um, and then when she Back on home out, soil, the pair spotted a gap in the market. There are no food tour companies here in Egypt, but it's very popular in other parts of the world. And Egyptian cuisine is so underrated. It's always overshadowed by the monuments and by all of the historical tours. And mm -hmm. um, that's really the reason why a lot of people come here, but no one really comes here for the food. So this area... The tours were launched just a year ago and include the area that borders Tahrir Square, the site of the 2011 uprising. And around seven years ago, prior to the revolution, the street was very popular for being, you know, the area where students from the American University, which is on the right there, used to kind of hang out, you know, and have like their coffee and tea. So the aim is to offer small groups a genuine and perhaps grittier Cairo experience through walking, history, culture and food. First stop on my tour is a family-owned business which specialises in the country's most ubiquitous dish. So this is koshari, okay? Koshari is the national dish of Egypt yep. and you can get this from like very, very cheap, all the way to a gourmet, deconstructed koshari dish. You have lentils, yep. you have chickpeas, you have these fried onions, mm -hmm. and you also have rice, you have macaroni. All in this one salad. dish? Yes. Yeah. It's typical of Middle Eastern food. A melting pot of influences from former rulers such as the Ottomans to Mediterranean countries and beyond. Okay, I'm gonna give it a go. Mm. It's very rich. The onion flavour is coming out. I can get the kick Perfect. as well from the from the spice, the peppers, and the garlic as well. I like it a lot. Egyptians love social media almost as much as their grub. And that's led to increased awareness of the latest culinary trends and fusions. Since 2011, some 6,000 new restaurants have opened in Cairo. Young people in the country, a lot of them want to kind of be their own boss. They want to be entrepreneurs. They want to give back to the community somehow. Mm -hmm. And what better way to do that than with food? Restaurants are coming up with more and more unique concepts to fuel demand. 
but it's also meant that places serving traditional dishes with a twist are now on trend. Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. This unassuming eatery specialises in a local favourite called haoshi. Can you tell me what these guys are doing now? For thousands of years, bread has held a special place in Egyptian diets. Their word for bread, aish, actually means life. Ancient workers were even paid in the staple. It's a food you'll find with every meal. Haoshi is a bit like an Egyptian version of a hamburger. But here, it's been upgraded. So when would you eat this? That's what I like, I like. Anytime. I love this. So gooey that I have to put on some gloves to eat it. Serious. As we say in the UK, the proof is in the pudding. Mm. That's good. It was really tasty, it's very rich. Tell him not to give away too many secrets, otherwise people will steal your recipe. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt that this tour has shown me a completely new experience. I'd never have tried these dishes if I'd been eating in my hotel. This trip has definitely given me a genuine taste of Cairo. Well, that's it for this week's show. But coming up next week... I'll be here to guide you through some of our best bits from the last few months on the road. Oh, hi. We've had some pretty special times. Probably. From Rajan's encounter with some of the scariest beasts in Mauritius. I can't believe it. This is weird. Hurry. <laughs> to Mike's breakneck trip around Manila on one of its iconic jipneys. The traffic here is a little bit crazy. So do join us then. But in the meantime, from me and all of the Travel Show team here in Amsterdam, it's goodbye.